after I had my interview with Professor Udo Mernig of Yongsan University in South Korea, um, which we broadcast on this podcast a while ago, through the summer, um, we chatted and Udo asked me if I would like to contribute to the conference that he was organising um, called Taekwondo and the Olympics, Past, Present and Future Directions at Yongsan University on the 6th of November 2020. Now, because of the global pandemic, this was to be a, an online conference. So we were to pre-record our presentations in advance. I said that I didn't really have anything to say about sport or the Olympics. And I didn't really know much about Taekwondo, but he suggested that I might have something to say. And he invited me to contribute with anything that I wanted to contribute. So I thought about it and I thought, okay, I can probably give some speculations on some issues to do with Taekwondo related to my experience both of Taekwondo and of researching martial arts in the social and cultural context. So in what follows today we're going to break with the usual protocol. I won't be interviewing someone. I'm going to share with you the presentation that I recorded for the conference. Um, if you are listening on the podcast, then you'll just get the audio. If you're watching on the Martial Arts Studies YouTube channel, then you'll see all sorts of, of flashy things on the screen. This was one of my first experiences of playing with iMovie, and I had a whole lot of fun with it. So today, for a change, it's just me, and I am giving a paper called How to Talk About Taekwondo. Taekwondo has a problem. Actually, Taekwondo has two problems. They are entrenched, but they can be fixed if we improve the ways we talk about Taekwondo. My name is Paul Bowman. I am Professor of Cultural Studies at Cardiff University. I've researched and written about martial arts and culture for over a decade and I offer my thoughts on this subject because I care about the study of martial arts in all senses of the word study. So what are the problems? The first is the problem of its founding myths. The second is the way Taekwondo is positioned and presented in many places today. Specifically, its founding myth is holding it back. And in trying to be all things to all people, Taekwondo overreaches itself and ends up being less than it could be. These two things ultimately signal a third problem, one that is more fundamental. This is the one that I want to broach today. It's the problem of how to conceptualise and talk about Taekwondo, which is the title of my presentation. Now, about Taekwondo's founding myth, that it is a direct descendant of an ancient indigenous Taekyon. I won't spend too much time on this. This myth has already been well and truly busted, not least by the excellent historical studies of Professor Udo Mernig. Professor Mernig has done the most amazing job of revealing Taekwondo's origins, along with others like Alex Gillis, his important historiography corrects the historical record. Principally, this historiography shows clearly that Taekwondo is a modern martial art. And despite the fantasies of many history fetishists, being a modern martial art is no bad thing. Most Asian martial arts are unequivocally modern. Most have histories no older than the 20th century. But yes, indeed, most of them also trade in the Orientalist fantasy of ancient origins, which is a pity. But the fetishistic attachment to timeless indigenousness is a huge problem. It is the hallmark 
of a dangerous ethno-nationalism, ethnocentricity, ethno-nationalism. Just because the young post-war Korean nation felt deeply bitter about its Japanified past, this does not mean that the obvious Japanese markings of Taekwondo can be disavowed. And yes, despite decades of reconstruction, its Japanese origins are obvious to any with eyes that can see. Taekwondo comes from Shotokan. Better than the retreat into ethnocentric denial, disavowal and foreclosure would be to embrace its status as a post-colonial martial art. And Taekwondo is very much a post-colonial martial art. Its invention was political, of national importance, during a process of reconstruction. But its origins are clearly marked by the Japanese martial arts imposed on Korean soldiers. It clearly did not make a simple leap from an older indigenous Taekyeon to modern Taekwondo. Of course, the Taekyeon origin narrative is understandable. Having an older indigenous art that could write Japan out of the narrative serves many functions post-colonial reinvention, identity reconstruction through an effectively effective historical narrative, what the philosopher Jacques Derrida called teleopoesis, the invention of a where we are from, which tells us where we are now, and hence where we are or should be going. But it's also a driver of ethno-nationalism, all of which is understandable, but it is obsolete and should be abandoned. Because now, although originally the origin narrative sought to build a national identity, it is now an albatross around Taekwondo's neck. It actually makes scholars outside of the japan Korea chiasmus laugh. In a sense, this is a kind of laughing at Taekwondo, but really the joke is on the continued efforts to prop up the origin myths. Better to abandon a myth once it's been busted, especially if it has served its purpose. The myth could have been jettisoned as soon as Taekwondo became an Olympic sport. In Olympic sports, all that matters is attainment, achievement, success. The country that invented the sport can be proud, can revel in cultural capital. And all that matters is who won last time and who will win this time. To configure Taekwondo as a sport is certainly one way to talk about Taekwondo but it still does not seem to be the preferred way in South Korea. This is doubtless because the authorities feel that this misses something, or that Taekwondo or Korea misses out on something if it merely becomes called a sport. This is doubtless why the Taekwondo one and the Kuki one and the other authorities market Taekwondo as being all things to all men, women and children. Fun for children, supreme discipline for teens and young adults, and even something akin to Tai Chi or yoga for older generations. The marketing and the packaging for Taekwondo in Korea wants it to be all things to all people. But this too can be seen through, and it is seen through, and does a disservice to Taekwondo. It is clearly marketing hype. It is clearly soft power. It is clearly a hegemonic project. For scholars to buy into any of it and repeat it uncritically and echolalaically is a disservice. So what would it be to do a service and not a disservice to Taekwondo in terms of studying it? My suggestion is simple. It is apparent to any with eyes to see that Taekwondo has always been intertwined with questions of Korean cultural identity. It's a key part of cultural soft power of Korea's domestic and foreign policy, and that is understandable, certainly. But where does it leave not only the scholar, but also the practitioner, when it comes to working out how to think and talk about Taekwondo in terms of the ontological question of what it is? Clearly, no one should buy into the myth when it is patently false, a simple untruth. Should scholars and practitioners be part of the machine selling soft power? Clearly there are not only factual, but also ethical and political considerations of integrity here. 
As Adam D. Frank noted in his ethnographic study of Tai Chi Chuan, given the cultural status within modern China of practices like Qigong and Tai Chi, it would be inconceivable to propose a research project in China into Qigong or Tai Chi Chuan that did not in some sense start from the premise that Qigong and Tai Chi Chuan are definitely good for you. Posing the alternative question of whether they might be bad for you, for instance, is verboten. Similarly, as Luke Wacom put, once put it, on any given issue, there are often powers that want us to all to formulate the matter in the ways that they want them to be formulated. So the key is to ask, how are issues surrounding Taekwondo formulated? Who is formulating like them like that? Why? Any scholar and researcher has to ask such questions. There are questions about the discourse and ideology of a given formation. There are preliminary questions about the discursive and ideological context. Establishing the contours of the ideology and discourse allows scholars to attain a critical purchase on the situation. It allows us to become alert to the ethical and political issues surrounding our work, permeating our work perhaps. A different approach, which might appear less political, more abstractly philosophical, can also take us to the same place. In it, we just stop and try to think about how we think and talk about Taekwondo. What kinds of thoughts and questions about it are commonplace? What kinds are dominant? What kinds are mandatory or expected? The flip side then becomes the question, what kinds of scholarly thoughts and questions about Taekwondo are rare or marginal or deemed to be preposterous or forbidden? And then comes the question, why? Why are these approaches dominant and why are other ones rare or non-existent in this field or in these waters. Even without knowing detailed histories, without naming names or pointing fingers, it is possible to grasp in an abstract, principled, philosophical sense that the way we conceptualise, formulate and engage with any object or practice has potentially profound ethical and political implications and ramifications. It determines what we think it is, what we are able to allow it to be. In the case of Taekwondo, the dominant formulations of what it is always urge us to conceptualise it in terms of being either a martial art or a combat sport, or both. Sometimes, even on the other side of the world where I am, we hear other voices that ask us to think of it as an expression of Korean culture. This conference asks us to think about Taekwondo exclusively as a sport in relation to the Olympics. But I want to ask, are these familiar approaches really the primary, most fundamental, most important, accurate or encompassing ways to think and talk about Taekwondo? The philosopher Hegel once noted that whatever is familiarly known is not properly known precisely because of its familiarity. Familiarity, he suggested, is the commonest form of self-deception. From here, my suggestion would be that one way we might do justice to Taekwondo would be for any and all kinds of scholars and students of Taekwondo to try to defamiliarize it in their thinking and their approaches. If we think Taekwondo is incredibly serious, what happens when, you, when we approach it as trivial and fun? If we think it's all about efficiency, what happens when we approach it as drama? If we think it builds ethical citizens, what happens when we pose the question of narcissism, excess, spectacle or selfishness? If we think it's philosophical or ethical or national or ethnic, what happens when we consider the opposite? If we consider it as one thing, what happens when we think of it as less than one thing, more than one thing, incomplete, expanding, transforming, and so on? Don't get me wrong, 
I'm not suggesting that I'm the first person who's ever said this. There are wonderful scholars who take Taekwondo as their object and treat it in amazing ways. My friends Martin Minerick, Spencer Bennington and others treat Taekwondo in incredibly creative ways. But I am suggesting that whichever way you think and talk about Taekwondo, maybe you should also try to do the opposite. Taekwondo is deadly serious, is it? So what about fun, fantasy, play, creativity? Taekwondo is ancient, is it? So where does that leave invention, innovation, creative revolution within it? And Taekwondo is Korean, is it? In what ways can it be said to be so, to remain so today? And if it's global, international, a kind of gift to the world, why would it want to be so or need to be so? Or Taekwondo is about building peace, freedom, friendship, community and so on. But each of these ideas also have their dark sides and their bright sides, of course. Taekwondo has many bright sides. I practiced it when I was younger, loved it, and it was a delight. There is something indescribably delightful about high and fast kicks, about spinning and jumping, about thwacking the paddles. It's joyful, delightful, healthful, and so much more. And this is my point. Perhaps my only request, that before talking about Taekwondo, we take the time to talk, because we need to talk about how we talk about Taekwondo. Thank you.